once you achieve that black belt, you feel like there's really nothing that you can't achieve. Hello, everyone, and thanks for listening to episode 26 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the most interesting stories from the best martial artists. I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm also the founder of Whistlekick, makers of the world's best sparring gear, as well as awesome apparel and accessories, all for traditional martial artists. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and remind our veterans that I'd really appreciate your help in spreading the show. You guys have been doing a great job lately, so please keep it up. You can learn more about our products, like our one-of-a-kind strapless sparring boots, at whistlekick.com. And you can learn more about the podcast, including all of our past episodes, show notes for this one, and a lot more, over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're on the website, please sign up for our newsletter. It's full of information, discounts, and lots of other useful martial arts content. And if you're an Android user, head on over to the Google Play Store and download our free Android app. Just search for Whistlekick. It's an easy way to stay connected with the show. So now to the review of the week, and this one comes in from Acrillion1983. Great mix of New England and national martial artists. Each guest brings many interesting stories about themselves and the history of the martial arts. New England coverage makes me nostalgic for competing on the Epone circuit. Well, thank you Acrillion for that review, and thank you to everyone else for the reviews that you write in. Remember, if you hear us read your iTunes review on the show, email us, and we'll send you out a free pack of Whistlekick stuff. And now for today's show. Today we're joined by Shihan Christine Bannon Rodriguez. Shihan Chris is a famed martial arts competitor, instructor, movie actor, stunt woman, and the list goes on. She's lived an incredible martial arts career and has worked with an amazing list of people. We had a great conversation and I was honored to speak with her. Shihan Chris tells what it was like to feel international pressure at a young age and dedicate yourself to proving the naysayers wrong. So with that, Shihan Chris, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you. I'm excited to be on today. Cool. Well, I'm excited to have you. Um, you know, it's a, a personal victory to have you on the show. As I told you, I was I was a fan back in the 90s, still a fan. I guess you never really stopped being a fan. So uh, this is fun to, for me. But why don't we start with you telling us about how you got started in the martial arts and why? Okay. Um, I pretty much... Uh... As a teenager, I was doing every sport that there was. I had tried uh, softball and basketball and ice skating, figure skating, um, gymnastics. I, I did pretty much everything. And, you know, unless you had, uh, you know, experience from being a young kid doing those sports, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, you're, you're learning. It's new to you. So you spend a lot of time on the bench and, um, you know, just... Uh, I did well in all of them, but nothing really hit me. And it was just uh, a girlfriend asked me, her brother was taking karate classes um, in the neighborhood. And she asked me if I wanted to go with her. She was going to try it out. And I did that, you know, when I was 13. And probably within a year, she had quit. And I stuck with it. I mean, from from the first day, I was like, oh, I love this. This is great. You know, (laughs) I I really enjoyed it. And it wasn't, you know, like I was getting picked on and felt like I needed to take it or anything like that. It was just, you know, I was just trying to find my niche, what what I would want to do and, uh, you know, for sports. And I, I tried it and I really loved it. Put yourself back in that time. Do you remember what it was? Because if you were trying everything. You know, some people will draw some similarities between gymnastics and martial arts, for example. What was it about martial arts that stuck out for you in a different way? Well, I think, you know, participation. Um, I was involved the entire time of of the classes. Um, mm. The classes were quite long back then. Uh, I think we'd have like an hour and a half or two hour classes. And, and there was really not much of a limit. I wouldn't get told I could only go to two classes a week or anything like that so you know I would attend even more and and you know seeing those goals of you know reaching your yellow belt or you know your your first belt and and stuff like that was was exciting to you know the more time you put in and the more practice the quicker you move so you know I I just uh I enjoyed it there weren't weren't very many girls involved at all so um you know, it wasn't competition in that end as far as other other girls being in the class, but it was just, uh, it was fun. Cool. So that's a good foundation, and you've been training a long time. We don't have to put 
years on it or anything, but I'm sure you've got a ton of stories over those years. Oh yeah. And I'd like, <laughs> so I'd like you to try and think about one, you know, let's call it your best martial arts story and share it with us. Oh God. That's a tough one. <laughs> I have a lot of stories. Um, I don't know. I would say, uh, you know, probably one of my most memorable um, in in my history would be when I actually went to the World Championships um, okay. in, in 1991 in England. And, you know, a lot of the countries, and still to this day, <clears throat> not just back in the 90s, but still to this day, are very... Um, there's not equality between men and women and the women walk behind the men. And, you know, there's, mm. there's certain countries like that, that still, still exist. And so, you know, they look down on women. Um, I went to the world championship and won a gold medal in forms fighting and weapons. And mm. that had never been done before. So it was like breaking the, the Waco, you know, world record by doing that. And oh. <laughs> my husband being president of, Waco in the United States, you know, would go to these president meetings when they'd have uh, different meetings and so forth. And, you know, he came back and just said, wow, you should hear the talk about you that, you know, it was just some fluke thing. It could never happen again. It was, you know, so, you know, that just aggravated me, got me really upset. And I was like, yeah. well, I'll prove them wrong. You know, so, so I went back and uh, did it again in 93 at the next world championship. And, you know, I'll say, uh, you know, won my gold medal in forms and weapons. And then I was in my last final match for the gold medal. And I, I mean, talk about pressure. I mean, I was just like, you know, I got to win the third one again, you know? Yeah. So, um, you know, that's one of the most uh, memorable uh, things. I mean, that, you know, I have funny stories too. I mean, that's not really a funny story. That's just, it's just uh, something that always sticks out in my head and still holding that world, you know, that record t title because still yeah. nobody has done it, not once let alone twice. Well, I'd like to hear one of those funny stories in a second, but let's let's go back to that. So, you know, here you, you do something that's never been done. And then, of course, people, you know, people like to hate. No, Nobody, well, I shouldn't say nobody, at least I'd like to think in, in our sport, people are generally pretty supportive, but people are obviously critical. What was your attitude towards training before that first competition in 91 and then the second one in 93? Well, I think my attitude pretty much stayed the same because I was trying to accomplish that just on the NASCA um, circuit and on the national circuit here in the United States, trying to be number one in all three and, uh, you know, win the grands and stuff uh, in all three divisions here in the States. So uh, I wouldn't say my training had changed too much, um, but I was definitely very determined to go back and do it again. And, and I realized that people were gunning for me and, and, and knew, you know, I would be in their division and, and, you know, it's not like today where they could YouTube you and stuff, but you know, they had the old video cameras and, you know, had me on yeah. and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I was very focused on that being my goal and being able to achieve that. And, uh, um, you know, so I would say, I would say my, my training pretty much, uh, remain the same um might have brought it up an, uh, another notch but you know i was i was very excited to go back and and give it a whirl again and, and try to prove everybody wrong and especially all those men <laughs> from other countries <laughs> course, i should say of course does one of those triple crowns mean more to you than the other um no i mean i think they, they both were were really uh important to me i mean um, England was, was nice because it was, you know, a different country. It was the first time I, I achieved it, um, or that anyone achieved it. And, um, you know, it was, I, I remember, uh, I remember fighting a girl and she kept, she kept, you know, like a kickbox that does bobbing and weaving. So yeah. she would, she would bob down. And as soon as I saw the opportunity, I'd drop an ax kick on her head. And, <laughs> and I was getting warned because you couldn't hit the back of the head so it was it ended up being the back of her head because she was kind of ducking her head down like a kickboxer right. would you know and and bobbing out of the way so when she'd do that it was just a reaction and 
you know, so I got warned and then, you know, I did it again and I got another warning and, and my husband's screaming at me, you know, do not kick. I'm like, I can't help it. You know? I'm like, I just, just automatic reaction. So, you know, he's like, don't kick again, just punch her, you know, because he knew I was, you know, that I was almost going to lose a gold medal and get disqualified because, you know, of how she was positioning her body and, and just my uh, natural reaction to see that opening and, and you know we don't really have that kind most girls most fighters don't do that in point fighting as far as right. you know bobbing like that and we don't really have that kind of rule here so it was just it was hard for me not to uh not to kick her in the head like that was that the last axe kick you dro- you dropped on her head yeah you yeah i tried to, yeah i switched <laughs> <laughs> i switched it was it was hard but i tried to tried to control it <laughs> So. You mentioned you have some funny stories. Do you have have one you you got ready you'd like to share? Oh God, I don't know. We've had uh, you know a lot of a lot of fun times with um, all the teams. Uh, you know, I was part of the Atlantic and Trans World Oil team back in the eighties, and that was a lot of fun being teammates with uh, Linda Denley and Billy Blanks and Nasty Anderson. I mean, that was just the the cream of the the crop. Um, you know, and then I went on to my husband's team, on to the Paul Mitchell team. So, you know, between the, the teams that I've traveled with, I mean, we always had funny stories and, you know, sometimes they weren't so funny at the time, but, uh, I, re- I remember we were, we were somewhere and, um, ended up getting, what happened? We, uh, we were in another country. I want to say, I want to say we were in England. Um, and I can't even remember what country it was, but I just remember, I remember we, uh, no, we were in uh, Italy, I believe, and we pretty much kicked everybody's butt and, you know, everything was all good and we were getting treated like, you know, royalty there when we kicked everybody's butt and then all of a sudden we were just left. We had, uh, <laughs> we had absolutely no way of getting back to the hotel. We're at, at like the subway or train station and. You know, they were closed. Pretty much all the trains had stopped. It was so late at night. And it's like, all right, how do we get back? We don't even speak this language. And we, <laughs> so you just feel like, you know, 20 or 30 big black black belts, you know, all, uh, you know, just standing there, just uh, totally clueless on how to get back to the hotel. I was like, I was like, go, go figure. You know, everything was good until we beat everyone else that, you know, <laughs> right. from here. And then we get left. So, you know. <laughs> Funny things like that, you know, traveling with the with the teams, and um, you know, uh, I remember one of one of the first times I ever competed in New York, and I'm not sure if it was in Harlem or in Brooklyn. They used to back when the Karate Illustrated days, when you would have re- regions and you would get your points, and you know, yeah. so it was kind of chasing points all the time. Uh, regionally to be number one in New England and then, you know, went on to trying to be a national champion. But when I was when I was doing that, I remember going to, like I said, I, th- I think it was Harlem. And I went there and I am the, like, only white girl in the entire place. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I went into the bathroom and, you know, had to use the ladies' room. And, you know, I had all these black black girls looking at me and giving me all kinds of dirty looks and, you know, uh, staring me down. And so I told my husband when I came out and he was like, uh, don't worry about it, you know, take care of it in the ring. And, you know, I got in the ring and, um, I actually had, uh, Joyce Santa Maria was one of the officials yeah. and, you know, she's, uh, from Long Island and it was the first time I ever met her and the rest were all men. And, you know, I mean, I was, pummeling the girl and I mean I kind of at the end it, it ended up being one of the girls that was in the bathroom but oh. I ended up I ended up you know like probably out pointing her by 20 points but it was like wow. you know I'd have to kill her to get a point and you know because I wasn't from New York and and it was uh you know I just wasn't the Harlem girl for any you know, I was right you know, so uh and that was that was my uh, first taste of New York and seeing what that was all about. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's it's changed quite a bit. New York, I think. You know, it's it's really yeah. um, quite different than it was back then. And sure. you know, we had uh, 
we had all God, so many different stories. I could go on forever. <laughs> I remember one time we were uh, competing in New York and we were driving and I believe it was myself, my husband, um, Richard Brandon, who has passed away since, and uh, Rocky DeRico. And we were driving to New York and, you know, we'd always get done at some ridiculous hour, like, you know, finals until 12 or one o'clock in the morning and we were driving home which is a good three hour ride and you know rich brandon if you ever knew rich he's he was always like wired and you know spitfire and tons of energy and he'd be working out you know doing push-ups and all kinds of crazy stuff before he'd compete and i'd be like why are you killing your energy right, right now um so he was like the only one full of energy driving home so he decided you know he was going to drive and you know, here we are, all of us in a car with a big, his big Quando sticking out the window as we're driving down the road. He got this big sword on a, on a, on a stick, you know. Um, <laughs> and we're driving, and we fall asleep, and we're getting close to Connecticut, and you know, the numbers are supposed to be on the highway are supposed to be going from, um, you know, like two or three all the way up to ninety three, and all of a sudden the num we wake up and the numbers are going the other direction. Oh, Rich, where are we? Where are the numbers going? Why are they going down now? <laughs> He's like, I don't know. All of a sudden, they changed and started going the other direction. So, so he had his head in the other direction, completely oh. wrong way from home. God only knows. <laughs> and then, and then, one time with uh, Rocky Dorico and Rich again, we were all driving to another tournament in New York. So we'd just get together and and just you know carpool together and stuff and. Uh, Rocky DeRico had this car that was, uh, um, something was wrong with the speedometer. So it was like 10 miles off all the time. So, you know, Rich ended up driving at one point and he must've been sleeping when we were talking about this. So I missed the whole conversation, but he was driving, you know, like 60 miles an hour with the car said 55 or 60 and, and you know, people were honking at him and flying by him. And, and it was like, you know, I don't remember, maybe it was 20 miles off on the speedometer. But people were <laughs> flying by him and honking at him. He's like, oh, my God, these people are crazy. What is going on? Why are they, you know? <laughs> we were just backing up. We were like, oh, that's funny. Oh, God, Rich, you, you're really only going like 40 right now. <laughs> 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 you know? So he had no clue. He was, uh, he was, he was always funny. He was Always someone that would make you laugh. Definitely uh, had a lot of fun fun stories about him. <laughs> cool. And we'll have time for some more stories as we get through more of these questions. But I'd like to take a step on to the next question now. Sure. And I'd like you to think about your time in the martial arts and how it's changed you. How has it made you a better person? Um, I think through the martial arts, I have probably my whole childhood I was an extremely shy, shy person, um, and I still carry those <laughs> those traits. Um, but I think the martial arts really gave me a lot of confidence, and you know, to go out and do things, whether it was in the work field or competing, or you know, speaking at different places and doing different things, or, or getting involved with film work. Um, you know, I was extremely, extremely shy. And I think that has really, um, you know, changed me through the martial arts. And then also, um, you know, once you earn your black belt, you kind of feel like there's nothing else that you, you can, cannot achieve. You know, I mean, I, I remember one of my, one of my students recently, we were talking about my son and, you know, he had talks about, entering the, you know, Air Force or something. And one of my black belts is like, oh, my God, boot camp is nothing after black belt test. Boot camp is a piece of cake. He would do fine. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but I really don't want my kid going off the wall, you know. Yeah. But, you know, once you, once you achieve that black belt, you feel like there's really nothing that you can't achieve. Um, as long as you stick, you know, you, you learn that, that attitude of, you know, I can do anything that I set my mind to and you can achieve it. So, um, you know, I think on the, on the shyness level, a lot of times, you know, people come over and talk to me at tournaments and stuff. And 
I'm, uh, you know, very friendly to people. I, I, I talk to people, but I'm still, still have that shy quality. So it, if mm. you don't come over and talk to me, I'm probably not going to walk over and just talk to you if I don't know you. So, sure. you know, and so sometimes people say, gee, I think she's stuck up. And I hate when people say that because they just don't know, uh, you know, what goes through my head. But I'll give you a story on that one on being shy. Yeah. Was, <laughs> I went to a couple of na- uh, they weren't NASA, they were Karate Illustrated um, national tournaments when I was like 17. I went to the Bluegrass was my first one. And I went to Chicago. And then the third one, I was going to go to Washington, D.C., which was the U.S. Capitol Classic. And my husband didn't tell me until the night before we were leaving. Um, I didn't buy me. He wasn't my husband at the time, but we were, we were dating. And he said, I didn't buy you, me a plane ticket. <laughs> You're going on your own. And I'm like, oh, my God. 17 years old and the tears. I'm like, I can't. That means I got to talk to the plane person all by myself. I got to talk to a cab yeah. driver. I got to talk to the guy at the hotel all by myself. I'm like, I can't do it. I can't do it. You know, so he knew I was going to have that kind of reaction. So he waited till the last minute to tell me. And, uh, you know, he kind of pushed me, kicked my butt out the door and slammed the door and locked the door. And, <laughs> and you know, kind of forced me to do it. And, you know, from that point on, you know, I, I, uh, you know, that was one of the things that kind of broke that shyness because, you know, when you have to do something, then you find a way to figure it out. So it's a recurring theme through the martial arts for a lot of us that, you know, our instructors seem to have a good instructors anyway, have a good vision into what we need right. and forcing us to take that step, you know, even if it's not something that's directly in the dojo. Right. Like being thrown on a plane by yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was scary. <laughs> so think about a time in your life where maybe things were a little rough, a little rocky, and how you moved through it and how the martial arts paid a played a part in that. Um you know, there's always rocky times or or yeah. tough areas, but you know, I I would probably say um when I went to the World Championships in 90 in Venice, that was the first time I ever went to the, the Waka World Championships. And, um, you know, my husband didn't go. I was, uh, went pretty much with the Atlantic team and, you know, some other members of the U.S. team. And at that time, my father had had a um, very bad stroke. Mm-hmm. And he was only 48, but wow. he was not doing well and was in the hospital. And uh, so it was kind of like I didn't really want to go and leave leave my mother with that. I didn't know something would happen while I was gone. It was like a, a week trip. And, you know, he just kind of, I could tell he wanted me to go and my mother wanted me to go. So I went and, you know, I, I won one world title there in forms, um, but I took a, bron- uh, a third of bronze in um, fighting. So that's why I was like, you know, after that, I wanted to go back and win all, all gold medals. And, and that was the end of it. So, you know, that was a it was a tough, uh, tough thing to do. But I, if I was there, it was like I, I had to make it worthwhile. I had to make sure I was, you know, giving it my 100 percent and not focusing on, you know, his being in the hospital and everything. You know, I, it took that time to go and be away from home. So I wanted to make sure I gave it 110 percent. Uh, sure. You know, and then I, I came back and, um, you know, he, right after that, passed away. Um, and then uh, immediately after that, my mother was diagnosed with the worst breast cancer that you could possibly ever get. So she passed away in the same year. So, you know, it was it was a rough year, but I was, um, I was, how old was I, 18? Uh, no, I was uh, a couple of years after that. I remember I was like 20, 21 and running my own school and, you know, dealing with that as well. And, you know, losing two parents at that age and uh, being a legal guardian of my younger brother. And it was, it was a lot to handle. And I think, uh, you know, the martial arts, um, you know, gave me the strength to, to, to be strong and, you know, do what I had to do for my brother and for everybody else's sake. You know, How much of your 
I can't imagine what it would be like to be 2021 and, and lose both of your parents in such a short period of time. So I'm trying to put myself into that place. How much of your, I guess, motivation to carry on, to follow through was about you and how much was about your brother? Because that sounds like a pretty motivating force to make sure that he's okay, that he's taken care of. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think it was, uh, it was when my father passed away, it was like, you know, I needed to be strong for my mother and, and, you know, help her deal with it. And, and, um, you know, and then after my mother passed away, it was more dealing with my brother, um, you know, being the, the adult in the family and being the one taking care of a a 16 year old at the time, you know, and, you know, so that that was all uh, very challenging, and and um, you know, the, like I said, the martial arts. I mean, it and it's the one thing I can say about the martial arts. If you if you are, a, I feel a true martial artist. When you walk on that mat, um, you know, it could be the class, the next class that I taught after going to funerals and doing everything or whatever. Um, but you walk walk on that mat, and all that is gone. You know, you're focus on your training, your martial arts, your students, you know, you put that smile on and, and, you know, you kind of, it kind of gets you away, like your happy place, you know, you get you, get you away from thinking about all the other issues. So, yeah. you know, no matter how bad of a day I might be having, I enjoy going to work. I enjoy going and teaching. It's, it's, you know, I put everything else aside and, and, you know, just focus on what I'm doing on the mat. Absolutely. So you've had a chance to train and meet a, a lot of great people. I, I'm, I'm sure we could sit here for probably 10, 15 minutes and come up with a great list. But I'd like you to think about all those people and then take your, your any direct instructors out. Who out of that list had the biggest impact on you? Um, besides instructors, you said? Yeah. Um, I would probably say uh, Pat Johnson who is a, you know, phenomenal martial artist. He was part of Chuck Norris's undefeated uh, competition team, you know, as a fighter way back in the day. Um, And, you know, he's choreographed or directed or, um, you know, fight choreography for so many movies, you know, like all the ninja, except for like the new, the newer day Ninja Turtle movies. Um, you know, he did all the Ninja Turtle movies, all the Karate Kid movies. Um, you know, he's he's done uh, the Batman and Robin and, and Mortal Kombat movies. And he's just oh. done so much as far as film work goes. And, you know, he was a very good friend. Um, you know, never talked to him about doing movie. You know, oh, I want to be in a movie, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, it was never that kind of relationship. It was just we were very good friends. Um, would see him from time to time when he would go out to the tournaments and stuff um, as guest, and you know we had a, a good good relationship. And then all of a sudden he, uh, you know, decided to he was doing the Karate Kid film in Massachusetts. They were filming in, in Mass, which is you know an hour from me. And right. they had a stunt woman who doubled for Hillary Swank that did. You know, she did the, if you saw the movie, she jumps on the car with the pizza delivery guy and she goes down this ladder off a building and she did some great stunts. She was a very good stunt woman, but she had put down that she knew martial arts, but she wasn't, you know, she probably would maybe yellow, orange, purple belt or something like that, mm-hmm. you know, and it wasn't really what Pat Johnson was looking for. He wanted someone, you know, that had extreme speed and accuracy and could do, you know, very difficult techniques and so that's when uh, he called me and said, you know, you want to come down to the set, <laughs> meet Hillary, meet me, the director. And, you know, cool. so, you know, that's how I, uh, that's how I got involved. And, um, you know, from that point on with history, you know, it's just, that's how I got involved in doing the film work and stuff. Um, so I would say he was a very uh, inspirational person to me. He, he's the type of person that he never seems like he's ever in a bad mood. Um, you know, always very, very positive, always, um, you know, confident and and giving you the right pat on the back and being, you know, just he's just a very positive, upbeat person. So, you know, I would say him 
And, um, you know, we've had uh, Chuck Norris in to our events, I think, three times now um, that we've had him in as a guest. Oh, and, cool. you know, so, uh, I've, and besides those times, you know, did some work with him on the World Combat League, uh, commenting, you know, doing different things. I've seen him, you know, yeah. besides those times. So developed a, a friendship with him as well. And, um, you know, I, I really like the fact that out of all his accomplishments and everything, he's still a down to earth type of person. He's not cocky. He's not, um, doesn't have that attitude. And, you know, and, and he'll remember people if, you know, he had certain people body got and, and, um, you know, help and watch as far as, you know, while he's a guest somewhere and stuff. I mean, and he'll thank those people and remember their names. And I'm like, wow, how does he even remember those people's names? He met them like, you know, yeah. you know, this is Bob, John, Mike, and Paul, you know, and, and he remembers it. And, and, you know, it's very, uh, very impressive that he doesn't let all that Hollywood go to his head at all. I mean, he's very, very uh, nice person to talk to. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I've, I've heard nothing but, but good things. I, I haven't been fortunate enough to meet him, but we've had a few guests on the show that have talked about him in, in a very positive light, just as you've done. So the next question is about competition. Certainly we talked about competition a little bit. It, it's been, would, would you agree if I said that competition has been core to your martial arts training and your martial arts career? Uh, yeah, I mean, up until brown belt level, I, I mean, I did compete all the way back, you know, I think as an orange belt, like back in uh, 1980, I competed, you know, as my first tournament. But, um, you know, I, I competed a decent amount of times up up through brown belt. But when I hit brown belt, I, I got more serious about it. And then it became where it was a goal of mine. And at that time, they didn't do any kind of ratings for under belt. You know, it was just a matter of collecting trophies and trying to beat the person yeah. that, that you lost to last time or something. Um, but there were no ratings or anything. So as I got closer to the black belt, I started, you know, watching the magazines and the, the Karate Illustrated regional ratings and the national ratings and the people that were on the covers of the magazines. And, you know, and before you know it, I, I, you know, I'm putting gear on at the Bluegrass Nationals at my first national tournament and Linda Denley's next to me putting hers on. And I'm like, oh mm -hmm. boy, this is crazy. You know, this is wild. You know, so, you know, it was, uh, you know, after I made my black belt and I got very, very serious about the competition. And, uh, you know, I think up until black belt, my main focus was trying to earn my black belt. I enjoyed competing, but it wasn't a love and a passion that I had. Um, you know, so I, my main goal was earning my black belt. And then once I earned my black belt, I got a lot more serious about competition because I wanted to be number one, you know, wanted to be number one in New England, wanted to be number one in the country and then went on to the world championship. So, I mean, I kept setting higher goals. And once I had done that several times at the world championships, you know, I have nine, nine Walker world titles. So after I did that, then it was like, okay. I mean, I went like, 11 months undefeated on um, the NASCAR circuit, you know, winning, winning every grand at every tournament, uh, national tournament. And, and it just kind of got the point was like, how many more, <laughs> um, you know, like if, if it wasn't a, a super hard challenge, I kind of like was starting to lose it a little bit in the sure. desire for the competition because I had won it so many different times. So then, you know, I had done the movie thing with the Karate Kid. I was like, you know, I kind of, I'm like a white belt there, you know, doing films that mm. I don't really know what I'm doing. I mean, it's totally new. And and so, you know, I kind of pushed my way through film stuff and, and put that more as a goal and kind of retired from competition. And, uh, you know, so then I had that as a goal and then it became, you know, my school and teaching seminars and. And, you know, I still like to do the film work and everything else when I can, but uh, I'm not going to be living out in Hollywood and, and beating down the door and doing auditions, you know, five a day until I get something. I mean, that, that's not my main focus, but if there's something local and I can get a job working, doing some stunt work, great. I mean, I love doing it, but, you know, I don't want to leave my school or make my kids pack up and move and go somewhere. Right. What what was the last fun project you worked on that that well, people would have seen? 
um, that people would have seen. Um, well, the martial arts kid, that movie is, uh, yeah, they're premiering it out in California and New York coming up, yep. um, this month. Uh, so that's being shown. That was with Don Wilson and Cynthia Rothrock and, um, a lot of other famous martial artists are in the film. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's kind of mostly about bullying. So, I mean, it's, it's a nice story. It was a fun movie to work on. Um, before that, I would probably say, you know, I did some work on Underdog and uh, some, other, some other local films um, that were filmed locally, but, yeah. but went, went big. Um, and I just actually did some work on a film uh, a c- couple weeks ago, and it was a very interesting project because it was two teenage boys that were both 19 and they met at the special Olympics like 15 years ago, 10, 10, 15 oh, cool. years ago. And they both have down syndrome and they decided they wanted to make a movie and they went, you know, one full steam on trying to make this movie. They did a, a quick start page. Uh, is that what it's called? Quick, uh, um, Kickstarter. Kickstarter. They did a yep. kickstart. They they raised almost seventy thousand. Wow. They had the actual camera that filmed most of the movie donated to them from someone in California, which was you know ridiculous. I mean, it's probably like a eighty hundred thousand dollar camera. I mean, it's you know yep. the the expense and just to have it donated was incredible. And um, so these kids just wanted to do make a movie, and you know, so I. I did some stunt work on it and stuff. So, so it was fun, you know, they wanted to, you know, very, uh, very interesting type of movie that they wanted to do. And that was just a few weeks ago. So that's not coming out soon. No, it, it won't be out probably. I mean, most, most of the time when you film something, it takes six months to a year before yeah. it gets released. So, okay. so I'll, you know, maybe after or or in the future, we can stay in touch a little bit because that's the kind of stuff that the audience likes to know about when it actually does come to fruition. So um, I'll I'll keep my ears open for that, and maybe you can help prod me a little bit when it's getting there. Okay, I sure will. So of all the people you've trained with, there's got to be at least one that you didn't get to train with that you would have wanted to. Oh God, there's probably a lot of people. <laughs> there's probably <laughs> who, a lot. Who would who would topple the list? Oh God, that I would like to train with. Yeah, living or dead. Uh, oh, Bruce Lee would have been cool to train with, <laughs> of course. Okay. Um, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of great martial artists out there that, um, you know, and everybody has something that they can give. You know, it's like I've always told my students. My my instructor always told me when you go to a, a seminar, if you can get one thing out of that seminar, they might teach you fifty things, you know. But if you yeah. can take one thing home that that helps you be a better fighter, or better at your forms, or a, a really cool self defense technique, you know, you got something out of it. You, you can't bring everything back, and not everything's going to be geared towards you. So, um, you know, between the two teams that I've been on with the Paul Mitchell team and and the trans world oil and the Atlantic team. I mean, I've had the opportunity of, you know, fighting with some great fighters. I mean, some of the most outstanding, uh, you know, people out there and, you know, it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, I'm trying to think, I mean, and then I'm also a member of EFC, which is educational funding company. And, um, a lot of big school owners are part of that, and we get together. We have conventions at least once a year, and I get to, you know, a lot of them will share different techniques and, and workouts. And, and, you know, I've gotten the chance to work out with, you know, Ernie Ray Sr. and Stephen Hayes and, um, you know, Stephen Stone and, and a lot of just really impressive people, Dave Kovar and different people like that. So um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, Maybe maybe someone uh you know, maybe someone like uh Ronda Rousey or someone like that, you know. Yeah, that's, that's not kinda like in my not really in my world as far as, you know, sport karate and, and martial sure. arts. MA is totally different, but you know, the uh 
I, I, I don't enjoy watching the pounding ground stuff, but when they get into the, like a lot of the jujitsu locks and, and rolls and throws, I mean, that, that's really exciting to watch. But, you know, as far as the other stuff, no, I, I'm not a big fan of all the, all the ground and pound and especially with women. I, I don't, I don't think that's where we should be teaching, uh, you know, our young girls to, to move on with. We could have, I'm sure, a whole conversation, you know, we'll do a whole episode on, on MMA. You know, we've had some pretty strong opinions expressed on the show, and, and I've got some, some thoughts as well. But um, I think at the heart of it, I, I personally, I like watching the amateur stuff because after they're done beating on each other, you know, just as most of us are in traditional martial arts, you know, we hug at the end most right. of the time. I mean, there's going to be some rivalries. There's going to be some egos. That's always going to happen. But as the UFC has grown, that seems to be fading a little bit as more money comes in, as as it becomes more of a spectacle. But I'll still, I mean, we've got local MMA events that happen in gymnasiums. And um, I went to one last year that was at, at a, a facility attached to a mall, shopping mall. And these guys will beat the tar out of each other and then, then hug. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, they'll be training together. You know, mm-hmm. and I think that's great to watch. Yeah, and um, I've had the opportunity of going to one of the Gracie's seminars, and uh, cool. you know, I think um, you know it, it'd be cool if they had a school more close by, and you could uh, actually train with you know someone like that, and and in something different, you know, in, in a different style. But I mean, I've even had the opportunity opportunity of training with someone like you know, because I'm a Kempo stylist training with Ed Parker and Nick Serio and George Bizzari and being certified by all of them um, yeah. and testing under all three of them. So, I mean, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to work with an awful lot of people. So um, there's not too many people I, I can say I, you know, would love to have the opportunity to train with because I've pretty been very, very fortunate with all the yeah. teams and different organizations I've been, been involved in and, and my lineage and Kempo of the people that I've been under. Yeah, it's certainly an impressive list, and I'm, I'm jealous of it, to be sure. <laughs> so we've talked about some of the movies that you've been in, and I'm going to guess that you like martial arts films. I mean, it's something you enjoy watching. Do you have a favorite? Uh, I would probably say, you know, the, the Karate Kid films are probably, probably uh, my favorite. You know, in the earlier ones, you know, like the first one, you know, it just, uh, it was just one of the the first martial art films that kind of portrayed similar to how things are, you know, in, in a way, you know. So, you know, having the bad karate instructor and, and uh, you know, we all, we all deal with that, that you get the guy down the street that can, can be like that sometimes, you know, so, right. um, you know, so I would, I would say that was probably my favorite. And, you know, the, uh, the other thing that I, I really enjoyed was when I worked on uh, WMAC Masters, that TV show, and we went two seasons yeah. with that. Um, I thought that was a great show, not just because I was on it, but just everybody that was on it were legitimate champions, um, pretty much. And, and, you know, so we were all working together. We all knew each other. We we're all friends. We we're all true martial artists. We weren't doubling for anybody. We were playing ourselves, and right. you know, in each time it was only a half hour episode on on Fox or whatever it was. I believe it was half hour, but they would always try to teach something, you know, perseverance or confidence or determination, and you know, so every episode had a point behind it, even though there'd be a lot of fighting and a lot of martial arts and and you know, it was a lot of uh, excitement, but they were still trying to teach the kids one of the values of the martial arts. Yeah, yeah. It was it was a great show and and one that I think a lot of us wish had continued on beyond just that short time. Yeah. How about how about actor? You had a favorite martial arts actor? Oh God, My favorite martial arts actor. Uh, probably between Chuck Norris and uh, Jackie Chan, I would probably say. You know, okay. two different types completely. Yeah, for sure. You know, but one one's more on the practical and, you know, um, level where the other one's just so dynamic and just does such crazy 
stunts and, and fight scenes, you know, so, so they kind of cover both, both uh, ends of the world there. And funny. I, I always find myself laughing at Jackie Chan, even in the fight scenes. Yeah. <laughs> he just, there's, always, there's a sense of humor that somehow works in that I enjoy. Yes. Yeah, he's a very, very creative person. How about books? Are you a you a reader? Any martial arts books you'd recommend? Um, you know, I since I had kids, I used to I used to enjoy reading. Since I had kids and running my business, I don't get the opportunity to read as much as I like to. Um, yeah. you know, as but if I do have spare time to read, is motivational books or martial arts books that I would I would like to read. Um, the Zen and the martial arts. So is, you know, a, a good classic. Yeah. And, um, you know, Buzz Durkin was a friend of mine from up in uh, New Hampshire. I just came out with a, just came out with a book, um, very recent. And, uh, you know, it's the martial arts school owner's guide to teaching business and life. So, you know, he's a very positive instructor who teaches traditional martial arts in a very small community and has hundreds and hundreds of students. And, and oh. you know, they've been, the thing is that they've been with them for years. I mean, you know, you know, they're on 20, 30 years of training and now their kids are training or, you know, so he, he is a very yeah. family based and, you know, they don't go for the, the flash of teaching all the crazy tricking and, you know, whatever's hot in the new wave, whether it was cardio kickboxing or this or that, you know? So, I mean, he just still does his wedgie roo and, you know, very traditional school, but, um, so that, uh, that book, uh, I'm enjoying reading right now. And, you know, for the most part, it's mostly, uh, mostly motivational books that I like to, uh, get my hands on, but sometimes it's more trying to get like the CD or something and being able to listen to it when I'm driving because I drive so much to go into teach seminars and, you know, tournaments and different things like that. So having something that I can have on, on my iPad, iPod or my, uh, in my car while I'm driving is nice. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm the same way. I, I listen to a lot of podcasts like this mm-hmm. one uh, yeah. <laughs> while I'm driving, take back that time. And just to remind listeners, we'll, we'll link to those books and, and the other stuff that we're talking about today in the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Um, so, you know, we, we talked a little bit before about how you stepped away from competition when you felt that you had achieved your goals. And so it's probably safe to say you are a goal oriented individual. Yeah. So much. what are, what are the goals? You know, what's keeping you going now? What are your goals? What's pushing you forward? Oh, my goals are to really uh, grow my school. Um, mm-hmm. You know, to, to get the word out where I see, I see how much children benefit through the martial arts whether they're the bully kid that's picking on everybody and and they're just going down the wrong road and, you know, they're going to end up in jail or or something down the road. Um, They're just following the wrong types of kids. And then you have the other kids that are being picked on and, you know, they're afraid of their own shadow. They they, they are shy, timid. They have no confidence. Um, Some of them come from broken families, whatever the reasons are. Um, You know, I just see how the martial arts really fixes both ends of the rainbow there and brings it to, to the center and, and what a huge difference we can make with these kids when we're with them. Just like having a really good school teacher. I mean, my kids had the best kindergarten teacher coming, coming up and, and, you know, and there's like one other teacher that really stands out to me and really made a difference with them in school. But you only get them for that one year and it's not even a full year, you know? So right. as a martial arts instructor, we have those kids for a long time. And then you have all the people that come in that are the same way, the, you know, shy and timid and no confidence. And, you know, I mean, they, a couple years down the road and they're, uh, they're walking around shoulders back and confidence and, you know, going for owning their own business and just, you know, making new goals for themselves and getting that attitude that, you know, I, I really want to do this. And if I really want to do it and set my mind to it, I can do it. So you see the changes in people's lives that you make. So, I mean, right. growing my school and, and getting it more successful um, is one of my goals. Uh, still continuing to do film work whenever possible. And having my students, the ones that, 
you know, having them reach their goals. And some of those, a very small percentage, I'd probably say less than 10% of my students have goals in competition. So okay. my son won a world title last year in Italy. Um, it was one of the best, you know, best feelings a mom could have. I mean, you know, yeah. um, men, more than me winning mine, you know, just seeing him up on the podium there and achieving that it was just, you know, he, he went to Serbia several years before that and just finished out of the medals. Mm. Then the next, the, the junior worlds are every two years and the adult worlds are the off years. So, mm -hmm. so he went to Serbia and then two years later he made the team, but it was in Turkey. And the U.S. government advised us to not travel to Turkey especially in large groups, that there was a lot of up, uproar there. There was, uh, you know, it was not a very safe place for Americans to be. So we took their advice and didn't take the team. So mm -hmm. Dante, you know, my son had to wait and until this one came around. And, you know, so it was like he didn't have to wait two more years to go back and try it again. He had to wait four and, you know, mm -hmm. it was a long wait. So, you know, he was very determined to win that gold and, and he did. He won a gold and a bronze. So, you know, having my students cool. reach their goals in competition levels or, or whatever, you know, their goals are. And, you know, spreading, spreading the word of my knowledge of, you know, going around teaching seminars and, and doing that kind of stuff. Um, I enjoy doing that. I enjoy the traveling part, you know. And, and also uh, we have one of the NASCAR tournaments, one of the top-rated tournaments in the country um, mm -hmm. on the NASCAR circuit and we run the ocean state grand nationals in april every year so yeah. that's always a, a big goal of ours to you know make it bigger and better than it was the year before and try to have you know better awards than any other tournament or try to have you know top celebrities there and, um you know and just offering all the competitors from a five-year-old white belt up to you know the seasoned black belt a good chance of some really good competition yeah sure Kind of a lot of goals, but a lot of different Th areas. Those are great, and and I don't think anybody listening would think anything different than for you to have a multitude of goals and, and big ones, and honestly, ones that uh, you're kind of defining the degree to which you're you're reaching them. I mean, you could always make a tournament better. You could mm -hmm. always make your students better. So uh, it sounds like that's going to give you the, the fuel to continue for as long as you want to. So that's great. Yep. So you've mentioned seminars and, and appearances a few times. If people want to follow you, if they want to come to one of your seminars, how would they you know, stay up on what's going on with you so they could do that? Well, usually um, I do have a, a Facebook fan page. Um, okay. That's just uh, Christine Bannon Rodriguez. And, you know, I, I usually post if I'm teaching anywhere and, and keep people updated on stuff there. And, uh, you know, also through my my school uh, website, which is DonRodriguezKarateAcademy.com. Uh, we have a calendar up there, so it pretty much lists all the, you know, different events, tournaments I'd be going to, or if I'm teaching a seminar somewhere, and, you know, I have that pretty much updated like a year in advance as far as and just okay. add to it when things pop up, and so those are the best ways, I would say. Okay, cool. Um, oh, and the other thing, too, is in, uh, I don't know how I forgot this, but, uh, you know, I've, I've been working for Macho, Macho Products since yep. early 90s. And, you know, so I've still, you know, been a spokesperson for them and a uh, product designer and model for their catalogs and so forth. So, you know, it's, it's always uh, a fun challenge to try and come up with a new design on a uniform or a change and, and make the gear um, even safer than it is now or, or more appealing as far as, you know, the design and the colors. And, you know, so it's always a, a, a fun in, endeavor working with them and trying to get, a, you know, for martial artists, whether they're competitors or just use the equipment in, in, the, in the classroom. Sure. Cool. Those are great. And, and again, we'll have those all linked for people to check out. And... So I guess, do you have any parting advice? Any last words of wisdom for people listening? Um, well, I guess, you know, the biggest thing as a martial artist is you never stop learning. And, you know, I always tell when someone earns their black belt in our school, it's like, 
okay, now you now you're gonna really start learning. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like everything before that was the basics. You know, now we get into the good stuff, and and it's uh, you know, sometimes people put black belt as their as their main goal, and they think it's done there. You know, it's it's like graduating high school. You got to go on to college. You got to go on to your masters and yeah you know, bachelor's degree and then your master's degree and doctorates and, you know, there's just so much to learn out there and, you know, he, and even just in one style, let alone if you jump around and do a little bit of training and a few different other styles as well. So I would say to never stop learning, you know, always be a student. Um, there's always someone out there that knows more than you or a different style than what you know. So uh, if, if you keep learning, um, you know, it keeps your desire and, and your excitement level up. And also as an instructor, you should be walking your talk. I mean, you shouldn't be, you know, asking students to make sure that they're training hard and exercising and working out and you're not doing it. So um, mm. I think walking your talk is very important. Great advice. Absolutely. Well, I really appreciate you, you being on and, and taking the time and, and sharing everything with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I had a good time. Thanks for listening to episode 26 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Sheehan Chris. If you like the show, please subscribe so you never miss out in the future. If you could help us by leaving a five-star review wherever you download your podcasts, it would really make a difference. Those reviews help new listeners find the show, and you might hear us read yours on the air. If we do, go ahead and email us at info at whistlekick.com, and you get a free thank you pack, including some great stuff like shirts, stickers, water bottles. We won't promise what's in it, but it'll be great and we'll even pay the shipping for it. Don't forget to tell your friends about the show. Word of mouth is the way that we're growing most, so we really appreciate that effort. And you can check out the show notes with photos and links to everything we talked about today at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're there, if you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the guest form. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter so you can keep up on all things Whistlekick. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. And check out the great stuff we have at whistlekick.com. Gear, shirts, pants, and a whole bunch more, all made for martial artists by martial artists. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.